Yeah. Yes, sir. We can start now. Okay. So, welcome, uh, participants. Uh, you know, my best wishes from Kolkata. This is Abhijit Chakraborty introducing today's speaker. And uh, today's speaker is Professor Padmaja Prasad Mishra. And Padmaja is a very young uh, colleague of mine, although he has probably spent about six, seven, uh, eight years, uh, close to eight years, Padmaja. So, in, in Shaha Institute, oh, 10. So uh, in Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics. Now he he's he is those uh, modern spectroscopists uh, who has set up a lab and you know he doesn't use the kind of the modular uh, machines which we are uh, we kind of uh, you know we meaning we old school people and uh, you know typically biochemists and all they use. So actually here lies the beauty and here lies a bit of training which is needed and Padmaja has that. Padmaja did a PhD uh, from uh, Bombay IIT uh, with uh, on Indomitra's lab and then he did a postdoc in uh, Penn State, uh, United State, Penn, Pennsylvania State University as you know. And uh, so he is our uh, single molecule spectroscopist uh, of Shaha Institute. And not only that, he has published some excellent papers on uh, uh, DNA damage and, you know, DNA looping of DNA. So he can measure the, you know, the time, uh, you know, the, the kinetics of those, you know, formation of those small loops and uh, stuff like that. So it, it, is, it is a very different kind of a spectroscopy done at a very dilute solution. And, uh, you know, as, as the name says, he has a setup. And if, if you are all interested, I, I invite all of you on his behalf uh, that you can, whenever, you know, this, this COVID goes and, you know, whenever you are visiting uh, the city of Kolkata, join us, see his lab. And uh, without uh, further ado, I request Padma Jamishra to begin his his series of lectures on single molecule spectroscopy. Padma Jamishra, it's all yours. Thank you, Professor Sakravarti, for introducing me. A very good evening to all the participants, all the present uh, in this lecture series. I would like to thank uh, HBNI, SINP, and particularly the coordinators uh, of this emerging trends in biophysics, Professor Saha and Professor Chakravarti, for arranging this wonderful series of lectures. I'm sure many like me who are working in the field of biophysics are going to be benefited from this lecture series. Well, as Professor Chakravarti introduced me, my responsibility is to introduce the concept of single molecule spectroscopy to you and to convince you how the knowledge of single molecule method is changing the way we monitor and understand phenomena that are happening inside nature's nano machine. For first, past 15 lectures onwards, or probably during our uh, master's degree or BSc degree, or while doing our own research work inside the lab or doing any kind of laboratory work, we basically use many uh, tools. We use uh, spectroscopic tools to monitor the uh, spectral nature of uh, the sample. Many of the spectroscopic tools have been already discussed here, like NMR, mass, a part of APR, and uh, all these things. We use microscopic tool to visualize phenomena, visualize molecules, visualize different kind of interactions. We use light scattering tools. X-ray diffraction, computational and theoretical calculations, this chromatographic technique to separate molecules based on their um, size, based on their polarity, centrifugations to uh, separate molecules based on their size, electrophoresis, uh, separating DNA protein based on the charge size and everything. And if you compare all the tools that uh, I just discussed or we have been discussing uh, for the past 15 lectures, one common property that uh, we can find it here is that in most of the methods, 
we use a large number of molecules and interrogate them simultaneously. And when we take a large number of molecules and interrogate them simultaneously, but primarily we observe is a phase out of the property from all the molecules that are present in the system. For example, if we talk about the uh, absorption spectrum that we monitor for any sample, usually we get a very broad peak. That's very common. The absorption peaks are very broad. There are many reasons why the absorption peak is uh, broad, but probably one of the reason is the broad absorption peak probably because whenever we monitor the observance of a sample, we take a huge number of molecules, mostly in the range of micro, uh, micromolar or millimolar uh, concentration. And because there are a lot of sample, a num lot of number of samples are present, probably there is a probability that some of the samples are observing at this wavelength, some of the samples are observing at this wavelength, and so on. And whatever final spectrum we are getting is average over the number of distributions at different wavelengths. That is one reason. As I said, there are different other regions as, as well. So because we take a lot of molecules and we um, get the property that is addressed out from a number of molecules, these methods are in general called as ensemble methods. Well, there are different, many advantages of using ensemble methods. They are very robust. So, because the signal is directly proportional to the number of molecules, and I said, as I said, we use for any kind of um, uh, ensemble approach, we use a lot of molecules. For example, if you do a classical biochemical um, uh, measurement, one microliter of sample, one microliter of one micromolar sample usually contains six into ten to power eleven molecules. And if we do the experiment in uh, milliliter scale or even higher scale or higher concentration, the number get multiplies. So that number of molecules are there and we get average up about this. So if some of the molecules are even not working, if some of the molecules are not even showing whatever uh, property or whatever nature we are expecting from those uh, molecules, still we get a good average of, uh, of the property. If even some molecules are inactive, we still get a good average of property. Another advantage of using this robust techniques are there, uh, the microscopic observable that we can uh, see in this um, ensemble methods, uh, like change in temperature, change in uh, color, and many times we can just follow a reaction, follow a phenomena, uh, just monitoring the color, uh, change in color there. There are some disadvantages when we look, when we take, as I said, when we take a lot of molecules and uh, um, monitor the average property because all the molecular process and particularly when we talk about biological process, most of the molecular process are stochastic. So sometimes it is it, it appears practically impossible to synchronize them. And because we are following what happens at the pop population average, sometimes as I said, some of the molecules are not even work, working, they are not even active. But when we take the average, we end up getting a biased information. I just will give a simple example here. You can see the uh, arrangement of this um, match sticks. Some of them are um, horizontally arranged, some of them are vertically arranged. But if you take the average of these arrangements, if you take the average of the arrangement of these uh, match sticks, this is what we get. The arrangement, that is none of the match sticks are showing. That's what I said. It's not like we don't get any property, but sometimes the informations we get by averaging over a large number of molecules are biased. So we don't get the right property. There is a uh, popular, there are few popular uh, line uh, uh, by um, um, one of the famous anti-poet Nikonar Para, if you have uh, got a chance to read him. So he says, that, that actually explains the peril of averaging, I, I, I must say. He says, there are two graphs, you ate both, I ate none, and the average consumption per person is one, person, one bread per person, which again uh, tells that uh, uh, averaging gives you a biased information. Another disadvantage of 
the ensemble method is that suppose we are monitoring some there are billions of molecules in, inside uh, a system some of the molecules are in directive motion let's say some of the molecules are in diffusive motion that's different time and some of the molecules are no motion but when we take the average we miss every the precise details of those molecules particularly when we talk about the cell and the phenomena happening inside the cell there are so many organelles there are so many phenomena happening uh, inside the cell when you look the average property many of the time we end up of getting a biased information probably because of the averaging things that is the reason the physicist actually develop uh, this uh, single molecule methods once 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 i keep going and introduce you, you what a single molecule method is you could really understand it's nothing new all the things that we are going to use are the fundamental very fundamental things that we have learned during our early career of our academics so it's nothing new but combining all these uh, methods uh, the single molecule methods have been developed and it is becoming very popular among all the biologists and all the biophysicists because of their uh, precise uh, informations we get so what are the advantages of using single molecule as i as abhijit said and as uh, the name suggests single molecule measurements means monitoring one molecule when when we talk about the ensemble methods we say we monitor a lot of molecules together but in single molecule instead of monitoring a lot of molecules together we keep monitoring one molecule one molecule keep monitoring um, for some time and keep monitoring this kind of one molecule many of them so they are very useful studying complex biological processes and particularly if we check uh, the biological processes many of the biological events actually happen at single molecule level well let me explain it so if you talk about translation one ribosome binds to one mrna called one trna at a time and binds to one elongation factor t so well in single molecule methods then this entire system of translation considering uh, one ribosome one mrna one uh, elongation factor t uh, t u or one trna that's called as one molecule so one molecule means not the con convention of conventional one molecule it's a one entire system that's what it's called as one molecule in single molecule measurements similarly if we talk about dna like replication also one dna one uh, it binds to one um, helicase and the entire function is done so that's why most of that's what i i said most of the biological events they happen at single molecular level additionally there are many uh, uh, things that is happening inside the cell which happens at very tiny steps like small movements uh, the example that i have given it here the stepping of a kinase which is uh, basically carrying a carbo carbo and working on the fibrils so those step steppings actually happen in nanometer scale so and uh, the uh, ensemble methods it's difficult to monitor any changes that is happening inside the nanometer scale these are the advantages of uh, single molecule methods it uh, reveals distribution uh, of heterogeneous system like if there is a static heterogeneity or there is a presence of dynamic heterogeneity in the system we can easily monitor them if you are monitoring a sequential or processive reaction a is going to p is going to c is going to t and so on at different steps single molecule measurements are very uh, useful in this case the best part is it detects biomolecular biomolecules under biological conditions and works at very open spaces there are many um, components many organelles inside the cell whose uh, activities probably still not yet known because of the abundance of that organelles very less so uh, uh, and the uh, conventional methods they need a high concentration of that sample so but uh, for this single molecule measurement you don't need much of the sample most of the experiments that we do our lab happens at picomolar mostly at sub picomolar uh, concentration cpd it has ultimate sensitivity 
basically it beats the diffraction limit I, I would say because in diffraction limited system most of the microscopy uh, so the best resolution we get is half of the wavelength that we use to visualize the system for example if you are using a um, laser of 480 nanometer the best resolution we get is 240 nanometer if you are using a laser of 512 nanometer the best resolution we get is 256 nanometer so in that range what happens to the system how do we monitor system happening in nanometer scale like uh, the previous image that i saw about the kinesin stepping so in single molecule measurements it beats the diffraction limit we can even if you if even you are using a laser of 5, 480 nanometer we still can monitor events that is happening in the range of na nanometer in the range of i would say 1 to 10 nanometer so that is that means it the ultimate sensitivity is a uh, major factor in single molecule measurements and of course it removes ensemble aberration so uh, because of that detect uh, rare intermediates which is not possible in uh, ensemble methods and do not need any synchronize because you are monitoring every molecules individually but the question is can we really catch hold of a single molecule of course, yes. Otherwise, there would not be any meaning of arranging this uh, this particular lecture. So, how do you uh, monitor single molecules? So, as I said, when I said single molecule, it's probably not one molecule always. We should keep in our mind that it's the entire system, which is called as a molecule. And we take one entire system and monitor it, and we take many of these entire systems and monitor them individually that's what it's called a single molecule it's not you monitor them together and get the average information you monitor them individually so it doesn't mean that one experiment on one molecule but millions of experiment on one molecule and one experiment on millions of uh, molecule but everything happens separately you can actually see one molecules separated from other molecule and you can analyze the properties of each molecule separately. I'll show you how an individual molecule looks like. It doesn't look like the way uh, we uh, used to see a protein molecule or an organic molecule or a dye molecule. It looks something different. I'll show you how does it look like. But the answer is yes, of course, we can. And this is what I'm going to tell you how we can. The easiest method is suppose this is what our solution containing a lot of uh, samples, dilute it. And dilute it in such a way that all the molecules are separated from each other. And once the molecules are separated from each other, you pick one molecule by mechanical means, which is the concept of atomic force microscopy or optical tweezer, which I'm going to discuss in my uh, next lecture in lecture two. The second method is you dilute it, make the molecules se sit separately, don't interact with each other. You dilute it, as I said, you go for picomolar concentration. So all the molecules are well separated from each other. And then excite a particular area where the number of molecules are less, but molecules are well separated. That is the concept of single molecule threat, which I'm going to discuss today in details. And the third method is, so these two methods that I described, there's another uh, uh, thing here in this molecule. All the molecules that you, you see here are not moving. So somehow uh, for this kind of measurement, we make the molecules sit on the surface or tightly bound to the surface. So they remain unmovable. They, they are called as immobilized technique. So um, optical feature or single molecule threat they are mostly immobilized technique. No, not always. Single molecule threat can be nowadays like people are doing um, in vitro single molecule uh, monitoring, which did not need to be uh, mobilized. But traditionally, yes, the molecules are mo mobilized. I'll tell you how we mo mobilize the system also. But the third method, if we do not want to mobilize the uh, system, because again, uh, though there are advantages of single molecule methods, there are disadvantages uh, as well associated. And one of these disadvantages is because we immobilize the system on the surface, 
that also hampers the real uh, phenomena to happen. So, but if you do not want to immobilize the system and still want to monitor uh, semi molecule, the same thing again, you dilute it, but the molecules are moving and use a very, very tiny excitation volume where we believe or you believe in the small volume of excitation, only one molecule is passing at a particular time. So that is the concept of fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, which I'm going to discuss in lecture three of this series. So roughly we can uh, divide single molecule uh, methods in two parts, fluorescence based methods and force based methods. In fluorescence based methods, single molecule threat and fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. And in force, both I'm going to discuss. And in force based method, optical tweezer, which I'm going to discuss in the next class. The magnetic tweezer and atomic uh, force microscopy, probably not. Okay, let's start with single molecule fluorescence, resonance energy transfer. Sounds looks very big, fluorescence, resonance energy transfer, but this is a very common phenomenon that happens. Um, uh, there's a very common excited state phenomenon. I'll explain what that thing uh, for those who do not know about this thing. And for those who know what FRET is, it could be a refreshing session. Let's start with fluorescence. Because single molecule methods, when attached with, uh, when coupled with fluorescence method, they become very uh, useful. What is fluorescence? I think most of us know that. So we know the molecules usually stay at the ground state, the electrons stay at the lowest vibrational level of a uh, uh, lowest um, electronic state. And when we excite it, it goes to the excited state. And because of that, we get a absorption spectrum and we can monitor that uh, this absorption spectrum using a uh, absorption spectrometer. There are many things happen when the molecule is at the excited state or the atom is, the electron is at the excited state. There could be internal permission, which um, brings the molecules to the ground state. But this is a non radiative process. We cannot see it using a spectrophotometer. But if it comes back, if the electron or molecule comes back to the ground state through a radiative process, that is called as fluorescence. And we can monitor that thing using this fluorescence spectra. And you can see that fluorescence spectra is always red shifted compared to the absorption spectra. That is because there is a loss of energy when the molecule is uh, staying at the excited state. There are different phenomena which is happening. One of the phenomena is sometimes the molecule at the excited state comes to another excited state, which is called as the triplet state. And the, the triplet state phenomena happens a bit longer than the uh, single state phenomena. And from there, it comes to the ground state by a phenomenon which is called as fluorescence. Or if it is a non additive uh, way, then it is called as regional permanence. So, when this fluorescence is happening, even during that, so fluorescence means the molecule coming from excited state to the ground state, that time many of the things can also happen together. One of the ways. Suppose we have a molecule. The molecule which usually gives a fluorescence is called as fluorophore. Suppose we have a molecule. We have a fluorophore and we are exciting this fluorophore. When we excite this fluorophore, it gives an emission which is called a fluorescence. If there is another molecule, another fluorophore, which is somehow kept nearby the first fluorophore, there is a chance that this first fluorophore at the excited state while giving the fluorescence can transfer its energy. So when the molecule is giving fluorescence, that means it has absorbed some energy, went to the excited state and having more energy than the ground state. So there is a possibility that this molecule from the excited state that donate that extra energy he has to the molecule which is nearby. Thus, this molecule comes to the ground state and this molecule start emitting fluorescence. If this happens, this is called as fluorial resonance energy transfer or fluorescence resonance energy transfer. We are not exciting this molecule, but because of this molecule has transferred its extra energy 
to this molecule, we get the emission from that. So the fluorophore which donates the energy is called as donor, and the fluorophore which accepts the energy are called as acceptors. And how much energy is uh, transferred from the donor to acceptor can be calculated by the famous um, Proster equation, which is given here, which is, uh, you can see, uh, depends on the distance between the donor and acceptor, which is R, or the um, Proster distance, which sixth power of the Proster distance, what is Proster distance? Proster distance is the distance when there is an efficiency of 50% energy transfer between donor and acceptor. So you can pretty much see, so the energy transport, the efficiency of energy transport, how much of energy will be transferred from the donor to the acceptor depends upon it. many factors. One is the distance, and there are other factors I'm going to discuss in the next slide. But the distance is a major factor, and if the distance is more, obviously, the energy transfer is more, and if the distance is less, the energy transfer is less. You can see, if, if the, like this cartoon says, the distance between the donor and acceptor is seven nanometer, and this cartoon says the distance between donor and acceptor is four nanometer. So for this thing, the efficiency is lower, and for four nanometer distance, the efficiency is lower, higher. But because from the, if you, Carefully look to the Proster equation. If we get the Proster efficiency from the intensity of acceptor and from the intensity of donor, we can back, back calculate the distance between them. If we back calculate the distance between them, it tells what is the exact distance between the donor and acceptor in nanometer resolution. And that's why I said in FRET and in a single molecule FRET, we can beat the diffraction limit. And that's why FRET is also called a spectroscopic ruler because we can monitor very minute changes, very minute changes that that is happening uh, in the range of uh, one to ten nanometer. As I said, not only the distance. If even uh, like the um, donor and acceptors are uh, very close to each other, it's not like always poster um, freight will happen. There are many preconditions for freight to happen. One of them is certainly the distance. The donor and acceptor should be within the range of um, uh, 10 to 100 angstrom. Another important thing is the emission spectrum of the donor should overlap with the excitation session spectrum of the acceptor. If there is a good overlapping, there is a good chance of energy transfer, and higher the overlapping, higher is the chance of energy transfer and higher is the efficiency of energy transfer. This overlapping is called as the overlapping integer J. I have not mentioned it here, but this J, which is the overlapping integer, also decides the efficiency of energy transfer. Another important factor that decides the efficiency of energy transfer is the transition dipole moment of, of the donor and acceptor. Basically, for an efficient energy transfer to happen, the transition dipole moment of, of donor and the acceptor must uh, oriented in the parallel direction so that the um, energy transfer is higher. So the more the distance is, so one of the factor I said, the distance, the more the distance is, the energy transfer is less, the less the distance is, the energy transfer is more. So the maximum energy transfer that can happen is one and it can go uh, down as the distance between the donor and acceptor increases. It also depends upon the overlapping. And that's the reason we say great uh, as a spectroscopy. There are many commercial available dyes that people are commonly using uh, to monitor this threat. There are like cyanine dyes, Psi 3, Psi 5. There are many versions of cyanine dyes now as it is available. Um, Commercially, Psi 5.5, Psi 7, um, depending upon the wavelength, there are uh, different, a series of Alexa dyes. If, if, if you just Google, you can find a series of uh, Alexa dyes also, Alexa 488, Alexa 555, all the, uh, denote the excitation wavelength of the Alexa dyes. There is a series of Alexa dyes also. There is a series of auto dyes. There is uh, uh, blue fluorescence protein, green fluorescence protein, then um, blue fluorescence protein, uh, CFP, YFP, 
FITC, uh, TRITC. There are many uh, fluorophores that we can use to monitor this uh, rate and to monitor different phenomena. The common uh, properties that a fluorophore, a, a pair of fluorophore um, to involve in uh, fret are like their photostability and particularly the photostability plays a very important role when we monitor at single molecular level because I said in single molecule you actually monitor one molecule instead of taking a whole lot of molecules because if you take one molecule if that molecule is not photostable and it's photo bliss you do not get anything at all like in ensemble measurements if you are doing the if you are monitoring the fluorescence in ensemble if even some of the molecules are photo bliss you still get a good uh, signal but here we cannot so photostability is a factor there are different ways to increase the photostability the high fluorescence quantum yield most of the um, uh, dyes that i have uh, shown here have high quantum yield high extinction coefficient small intensity fluctuation because we are monitoring um, single molecules fluctuation of intensity um, greatly hampers the signal quality I, I once i show you a real signal that we get from a um, single molecule measurement we can see like most of the signals actually appear like a fluctuation and if the fluctuation of dye interferes there it will be very confusing that's what after one emit in the visible region and the size of these dyes which plays a, a crucial role that should be as small as possible without perturbing the system of your input suppose you are monitoring um, a protein protein interaction or DNA, DNA protein interaction if you are labeling your dye to a DNA or to a protein that should not happens the con confirmation or the uh, inherent property of the uh, biomolecule sometimes because as i said uh, you have to increase the intensity to get a better uh, signal to noise ratio you use a uh, good uh, oxygen scavenging system because presence of oxygen reduce the photostability so you use a good oxygen scavenging system one of the popular oxygen scavenging system is glucose oxygen and catalyst that um, uh, oxygenates the um, water uh, oxygen to make it h2o2 that reduces the photos uh, efficiency of photostability that increases the efficiency of photostability i'm sorry and but that sometimes affects the triplet state lifetime because triplet state phenomena is happens in the micro uh, millisecond scale and most of the biological phenomena that happens in the millisecond scale it because of the high intensity and the presence of uh, oxygen scavenging unit interfere the triplet state phenomena with the single state phenomena as well so you have to be careful about that now how single molecule works and particularly how single molecule fret works if you are talking about fret the very first thing is we have to make sure we have two dyes labeled at two different distinct position of one particular molecule or two different particular molecules let's say we are monitoring dna protein interaction you can have one dye at a dna and one dye at the protein or if you are monitoring protein protein interaction you can have one dye at uh, one protein and another at another protein maybe the both the dye and the same protein if the single protein is changing the confirmation as well so the very first thing is we have to have donor and acceptor labeled to the system our interest why labeling is important the position of labeling also plays an important role monitoring the threat because depending upon how you position the um, donor and acceptor we get the threat efficiency just giving an example the um, soccer player well, the example of a soccer player or a, or a football player so while playing with the football the confirmation of the football football player keeps changing and suppose we consider this as one of our biological system how we label it to monitor different uh, uh, absence different uh, confirmation of the um, football player we can one ways we monitor the donor at the right hand and you as um, monitor the acceptor at the left hand and while playing the distance between the donor and acceptor keep changing and we can 
calculate the information from there. You can find out the information from, from there. Or you attach the donor at the right, um, right hand and accept her to the right foot. You can monitor the change in threat because they keep changing the distance. You can attach the donor at one leg, one feet, and accept her on another foot. And from there also you can monitor. So the reason of showing this cartoon is depending upon where you are uh, putting the uh, donor and where you are labeling the signal, you get different information. Probably you, many of the times um, you need to uh, label multiple places of your um, system to get a correct information. So well, as I said, the first condition is you need to uh, label the do um, system of your interest with the donor and acceptor. Then you dilute. Dilute the sample. I, I have shown you um, the importance of, of dilution because once you keep diluting the sample, you keep the molecules sit aside uh, from each other. So as a chemist, when you think of dilution, the very first thing that comes to our mind is by adding solvents uh, more and more. But there is other ways of uh, diluting the sample and asking the molecules to um, sit um, separately by not talking to each other. I'll show you um, uh, in a couple of next slides. But you have to dilute the sample so that you cut down the background. Use a limited observation volume. And uh, in that limited observation volume, whatever number of molecules, we monitor them individually. Many of the system while monitoring single molecule um, uh, uh, thing, we have to immobilize your system so that the molecules, because you are exciting a very small volume, sometimes when you monitor a small volume, there is a chance that the molecules is not there at all. It has gone to a different place because of diffusion of, uh, because of some other um, interactions. So some of the times, or many of the times, uh, we need to uh, immobilize the system to a surface so that it, it sticks to, to a particular position and it's not moving anywhere uh, because our um, volume of observation is very, very, very less. For single molecule threat to have one important parameter is using evanescent wave generated by total internal reflection fluorescence. I'll talk about this thing, how uh, evanescent wave helps um, monitoring single molecule threat and why we use evanescent wave, not a direct wave. We have to get very strong signal, so we have to use right fluorophores and when you get strong signals the resolution also increases and for that we have to use a, a very sensitive detector probably a electron uh, multiplane CCD camera that is a very common uh, thing that we use and then we plot the histogram taking many uh, the signals we obtain from a number of molecules. How does a single molecule look like? Yes, that's what I said. A single molecule does not look like a molecule that we have uh, seen a, in a textbook. Not look like a protein or do not look like a molecule, uh, a organic molecule or a dye molecule that I have shown in my previous slide. It, it just looks like a bright spot like here. And this is how when you uh, dilute the sample and ask them to sit separately, this is how do they appear. So each of this spot representing one particular molecule. And if you magnify it, what you can see is a pixelized intensity, which uh, you can see varies in the uh, range of microns. So why in a range of microns? Because one protein, if you consider, one protein would be uh, uh, maximum of, if even we are monitoring a protein uh, labeling a dye, the maximum size I would um, get from the protein is about um, 70 to 80 nanometer. But why that come in 250 nanometer? That is because of, in accordance with uh, Heisenbach's uncertainty principle, I think most, most of us know that because of Heisenbach's uncertainty principle, we cannot see a molecule that with their actual size, but we get an intensity uh, distribution which we generally call as IRI crops, IRI which 
the width of this LED is usually is as I said in diffraction limited spot half of the wavelength that we use but the tip of this spot is the position that, that describes the position of the molecule exactly there so if you just consider the intensity at the tip of this spot this is what we uh, uh, consider the intensity for that molecule so well how do we excite this as i said for single molecule measurements uh, mostly for single molecule freight measurement particularly in particular uh, mostly we use evanescent wave we cannot use a direct uh, laser light uh, use evanescent wave and i'll tell you why you use evanescent wave but let me first tell you how we generate evanescent wave for those who are not familiar with the term evanescent wave suppose we have a system we have a prism we have a slide keeping some sample here with some liquid inside this copper slip if it is visible to all of you and this is a prism so because the prism has a um, higher refractive index compared to the um, liquid sample so whenever we put an incident laser beam depending upon the refractive index either it, it will bend towards the normal or it will bend away from the normal well according to the Snell's law if n1 is greater than n2 it will bend towards the normal which is called as external reflection if n1 is greater than n2 it will bend away from the normal which is called as internal reflection so how much it will bend away from the normal that depends upon how much is the incident angle because n1 sin theta 1 is equal to n2 sin theta 2 according to Snell's law so if we keep increasing this theta i that means if we keep increasing this theta i this bending will be more the angle of this bending is going to be theta t is going to be. so if you keep increasing this theta i this bend this way will come more closer towards the surface and there for one particular angle it will come perpendicular to the surface which is called as total is which is called as internal reflection and the angle for which the internal reflection happens is called as critical angle critical angle is as sin n1 sin theta 1 is equal to n2 sin uh, theta um, r we can calculate the uh, critical angle which is uh, sin uh, inverse theta 1 by theta 2 for a glass water interface if you calculate because the uh, refractive index of glass is about 1.55 and uh, the um, refractive index of water is about 1.33 you can see the you can find the critical angle which is about 61 uh, degree okay what will happen if you still keep increasing this angle beyond critical angle if you still keep increasing this angle from beyond critical angle the ray will come back to the same surface which is called as total internal text it will not even go to the surface it will come back to the sur uh, surface come back from the surface and some interesting phenomena will happen at the point of intersection where the ray will come toss the surface and bend away there will be some electrical disturbance which will create which will uh, create at this point of interaction and they propagates parallel to the normal and these electrical disturbances are called as evanescent wave the, the characteristics of this evanescent wave is that they carry the same wavelength as the incident radius so if you are using a 532 nanometer laser you get a vanescent wave which is 532 nanometer as well and you can pretty much do the same experiment like if, if it is a normal day um, i would take take a class in any of the classroom i'd be using a, a normal uh, laser pointer if any of you have a laser pointer or a key ring with a laser you can pretty much do the experiment at your home take a glass of take a glass of water just put the laser pointer and keep changing the angle and for a particular angle if you do the experiment at night for a 
particular angle you can see the laser will go touch the surface of the water and come back you can see this total internal reflection well you cannot see the evanescent wave from the surface because evanescent wave intensity is very very less the intensity of evanescent wave uh, is uh, can be explained in uh, based of this equation which is which depends upon two factors the attenuation constant and the phase constants i'm not going in details of the equation but what what you can see is the intensity of the evanescent wave decreases exponentially so and usually the um, um, evanescent wave travels for about 60 to 80 nanometer not more than that so the reason of using evanescent wave is that any molecule that is present within that limit with this, this 60 to nanometer where the evanescent wave travels they only get excited if there is a huge number of molecules present let's say this uh, beaker it contains a huge number of molecules but if the evanescent wave is just touching the surface and going back only the first layer of molecules which comes within this uh, uh, range of 80 to 100 nanometer they only get excited not all the molecules And how much this evanescent wave travels depends uh, on the wavelength of the radiation also. So typically, if you are using a 532 nanometer laser with 50, uh, 30 milliwatt power, uh, you, you would see a evanescent wave that is traveling between 40 to 80 nanometer. And that is the reason why evanescent waves are used. Once the, the first condition is, we have already made the molecules to see seed separately by diluting it and now you are only exciting the surface so the number of molecules we are cutting down the background like anything only the molecules which are present at the surface are excited not all and when you make the molecules to sit on the surface and you ask the evanescent wave just to touch them there is no chance that you get any background uh, uh, while measuring the same molecule and i'll tell you how uh, we do that also and this is how a typical so as i said so this is what uh, is the basic of single molecule you dilute the thing and you generate evanescent wave and nothing else and i will make the molecule to see separately so this is nothing new nothing new everything appears to be very easy to construct a uh, uh, single molecule fed imaging setup and this is the typical array diagram of a um, uh, single molecule fed setup I'll explain it uh, a bit. Uh, this this system, as I just said, this system actually exists in my laboratory. On the um, fourth uh, lecture of this uh, series, single molecule uh, spectroscopy series, I'll try to show you this instrument, um, and I'll try to explain each components present there and how it works. I, I'll probably carry out a small experiment there also to show you how you uh, see the molecules and how you analyze the data there so we have a ledger you expand it so uh, keep a parallel laser beam and use a mirror to create this critical angle this is where actually we, so the prism is there on the um, slide the slide has different chambers as you can see which has the molecules of our interest and uh, the prism is uh, kept on the slide so this is how you create the critical angle so that it comes touches the slide and goes back so you are not using because anywhere the molecules the concentration of the molecules are so less in picomolar if you use a direct laser beam you end up the molecules are as i said the molecules are sitting separately from each other one molecule and you give a laser light irrespective of whatever the power it is it will photograph but if you use this evanescent wave the intensity is very less and the chances of photo bleaching is less and the chances of interruption uh, due to uh, background is very less so you create the uh, evanescent wave here and you have the sample here so you have both the donors and both the acceptors here well i have to tell you i, I must mention one more thing when monitoring the while monitoring the single molecule threat we have two um, uh, um, fluorophores one donor one acceptor and they are uh, probably labeled at two different uh, systems or one single system 
but it will appear like a single uh, die also here in the um, camera because they are very close. I'm talking about a distance between them are in nanometer resolution. We cannot separate it out. But you have once you get the intensity from both the donor and acceptor, you can separate the donor intensity and you can separate the inten uh, acceptor intensity. I'll show that thing while uh, demonstrating the instrument by using dichroic mirrors. So once you give, use a dichroic mirror, though both the in donor intensity and acceptor intensity are coming from the objective of the microscope, you use the, uh, the dichroic mirror, separate the donor intensity, separate the uh, acceptor intensity, and send to a camera, which is virtually divided into two parts. So, so you send the donor intensity to the left side of the camera, you send the acceptor intensity to the right side of the camera. It's a bit tricky because there is no virtual partition in the camera. The, uh, if you are talking about a 512 and 512 megapixel camera, there is no way you can uh, create a virtual partition, but you can send the signal. There are a way, there are, I can, I, I'll show you during that demonstration, how you send the donor signal and how you send the acceptor signal to two different part of the camera. Then you correlate, so the, as I said, the left side is the donor signal, the right side is the acceptor signal, and you can correlate this intensity because the left side and the right side should match to each other because they uh, represent the same molecule, but the dye intensity at the, and the, um, the donor intensity at the acceptor intensity. So you can calculate the intensity and calculate the threat and calculate the distance. And once you calculate the distance, if there is any uh, conformational changes happening within uh, the range of nanometer, you can find that. Thing. So pretty much I have explained most of the things how you uh, dilute it. Labeling strategy, most of the labeling you can do it uh, chemical labeling. Uh, that is uh, a, a full uh, lecture. Probably if someone is interested, they can contact me. I I'll explain how uh, the labeling happens, but that will take a um, whole lecture. I'm not explaining here, but there are a lot of commercial companies now um, um, nowadays available. You can just order your uh, labeled uh, system there. They will supply it to you. So once uh, you have your uh, system ready, label system ready, once you, you have your um, setup ready, we can monitor the threat from individual molecules. And one thing I have not yet explained is how you make them sit, how you make uh, the molecules sit separately from each other. This is how uh, a typical spectrum, typical spectra that you get uh, from this individual spots, individual molecules, those spots that I have shown you. So this is how uh, a typical spectrum you get when you monitor the spread. The uh, green uh, fluctuation, which as I said, it will actually look like a noise. If you see this actually looks like a noise because fluctuations are there. And uh, this is not from a number of molecules. You are monitoring one particular molecule and there, there is always random motions and uh, free rotations. So you see fluctuations of noise within the limit. So uh, the green uh, signal that you see is the intensity of the donor. The red signal you see is the intensity of acceptor. So when the donor and acceptor, they come closer, closer to each other, you see, you get a very high threat. And when they go away from each other, you get low threat. Like here, the distance is more, they come closer to each other. So this is how it, you see, like from a particular one donor, one acceptor pair, you see the porous fluctuation. How, why this fluctuation happen? Just I, I'll use a cartoon to explain that things. Probably you, suppose you have a, uh, DNA label with a donor and you have some protein which is you think it's sliding for some reason for uh, some bi biological phenomena is happening and this protein is sliding, sliding on the DNA. So the distance keep increasing and decreasing and because of that uh, the fluctuations uh, are there the fat efficiency uh, keeps increasing and decreasing. However, if the uh, uh, protein is sliding continuously and going away from the donor continuously, instead of finding a fluctuation, you can find uh, a continuous decrease in the fluorescence in, uh, rate efficiency. 
this kind of um, uh, fluctuations you get for many reasons this is a cartoon which is uh, made by one of my student uh, tebolina so uh, uh, explaining how a helicase uh, which is reg z binds to a fog dna and slides on the fog dna by opening the uh, uh, fog uh, to do the dna repairing process so because this um, molecule supposed to have the donor labeled at the protein and uh, uh, we have a acceptor label at this dna because this um, 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 helicase keeps moving uh, back and forth you see a fluctuation in the intensity so what kind of interactions we can monitor we can monitor one donor one uh, acceptor interaction like uh, your system entirely containing one donor and one acceptor you can uh, have sequential threat uh, like a donor transferring its um, energy to another receptor which eventually is transferring the energy to another receptor two parallel uh, phenomena happening simultaneously suppose we have one donor transferring the energy to one receptor and this donor transferring the uh, energy to another receptor and uh, multiple threat events happening happening in the same event when you actually monitor a more complicated biological phenomena so you can have more options like that also and then comes to how you uh, surface immobilize the sample to avoid the mobility of the system because of brownian motion or because of any uh, other motion other interaction one of the popular uh, method uh, you can go to this nature method everything is explained there uh, by rahul Ayan and tjha who is considered as one of the uh, pioneer in the field of uh, single molecule biophysics. So one of the easiest method is you use a um, uh, biotin labeled uh, BSA and put that on the surface of a quartz light. And then uh, once you put streptavidin, because streptavidin has four biotin binding pockets, they can go and sit on the biotin and uh, the uh, proteins are bigger in size. So they will uh, keep away from each other. And to the molecule of your interest, you put a biotin, and once you label that thing, that will go and sit on the biotin bind binding sites of the streptavidin. So this is how you keep them separately. You can use a combination of uh, PEG uh, and biotinated PEG. I'll again explain that thing in the next slide. You can use uh, histidine tag proteins and um, PEG with this nickel NPA. So uh, that will also keep the molecule separately, or you can just use um, a lipid bilayer encapsulating your molecule, which is a bit difficult because uh, many of the uh, things are restricted when you use a lipid bilayer, but you still can use that method. Many of the um, single molecule uh, spectroscopes they are using these methods as well. The easiest way that majority of the majority, I, I, I say, majority of the uh, single molecule spectroscopies are following is using a combination of PEG and biotinated PEG, like as it is shown here. Let's say you take a quartz light, you use uh, um, PEG and biotinated PEG. Biotinated PEG means PEG labeled with a biotin in 1000 is to 1 ratio and throw on your slide. What will happen is your slide will be covered with PEG and biotinated PEG. But for every 1000 PEG, there is one PEG which has biotin. So once your slide is ready, what can be done is you can uh, throw streptavidin. And as I said, streptavidin has four biotin binding pockets. So one of the biotin bi binding pocket will go and bind to the uh, biotin, keeping three biotin pockets empty. And as, uh, as there is a good back gap, because you have taken 1,000 is to 1 ratio of PEG and biotinated PEG, there's a good gap between one biotinated PG to another biotinated PG. Then you put another biotin, the experimental procedure, I should accept it's a bit tricky and a bit complicated, but it's not very difficult uh, and it's not like it's not real. It's real. So you put another biotin on the sample of your interest. Maybe it's a DNA, maybe it's a protein and you have donor and acceptor labeled. So once the streptavidin is there at the biotin, you throw the sample. 
So because other biotin binding sites are formed, they will go and sit on that and you start seeing the intensity of the donor on the left side of your um, CCD, EMCCD. Suppose this is a this is a example of uh, uh, DNA hybridization. I am just using two strands of DNA just uh, to dem for a demonstration purpose. How uh, you get the threat when uh, during the process of DNA hybridization? So you use one strand of DNA and do that. The other strand of DNA, the complementary strand, just label with acceptor. You don't have to do anything else. Just label with acceptor, and once we flow it, that will go and make a complementary with the first strand and as the acceptor is labeled there will be a threat and you see a um, threat efficiency and because of that as soon as the acceptor gets the intensity you see the dots appearing in the right side you are only exciting the donor suppose you are using um, psi 3 and psi 5 which is one of the popular dye that we use so the psi 3 excitation is at 532 nanometer the psi 5 then, uh, excitation is 637 nanometer so if you are just using psi 3 and psi 5 and using a 532 nanometer ledger you are no way exciting psi 5 but if you get the psi 5 signal at the right side that means energy transfer is happening and that's why you are seeing the uh, energy transfer efficiency at the right side of the camera and this is how you uh, see the signal i have already explained it and this is how you plot the threat efficiency. The most important part is how you uh, analyze the signal uh, that we get, the um, threat data that we get from the single molecule, from one molecule. So um, you actually get the intensity from each of these spots individually and keep analyzing them. And once you analyze them, there are, there are, there are different ways to analyze it. One of the popular method again that um, we use in our laboratory is called as um, hidden Markov model, which uh, is a um, statistical model that analyzes the this kind of fluctuations, how much time it is staying that um, at one state, how much time it is staying at the another state, and it gives the details about the time spent at each stage, the details about the kinetics and uh, the rate of the uh, processes in millisecond and microsecond time scale. So you can uh, do a fitting and you can see how much time it's spending in each of the states and uh, you can get a population distribution from there, which population is more, which population is uh, uh, less, at what are the threat states you get and uh, depending upon what are the threat states you are getting, uh, you can assign those threat states to different confirmations and uh, you can uh, analyze the phenomena that is happening. You can get the dual time how much time it is spent spending in each of the time and not only that you can uh, find out the histogram for every individual molecule you don't have to consider like the histogram that i'm showing here it is the combination of uh, all the molecules but you don't have to combine all the molecules um, um, our lab uh, many of the lab that that are practicing and uh, two students in my laboratory they were and the Bolina, they have developed uh, a code where you can actually find out the individual histograms of the fluctuations of every individual donor and acceptor and from there you can get the kinetic set of all the molecules you can get the heat plot what is the uh, threat efficiency and uh, you can get the details about any tiny fluctuation that is happening inside There are many examples. So, if I summarize the uh, methods of single molecule uh, techniques so far that I have discussed, we can monitor molecules individually and we can get the intensity from individual molecules. But for the threat to happen, we have to have two um, uh, fluorophores that are two different um, parts of the molecule. and when I say molecule, it's an entire system. So whatever um, biomolecular system you are uh, monitoring, that entire system is called as a molecule. Suppose you are monitoring the um, translation phenomena. So one 
one molecule in single molecule measurements while monitoring the translation phenomena is one ribosome, one mRNA, one tRNA, and couple of ATP because ATP it, you, you, the cell might uh, the ribosome might uh, require number of ATP so you can give more number of ATP but one ribosome and for one step one particular tRNA that entirely uh, covers one molecule when you uh, talk in uh, terms of single molecule measurements so for translation phenomena to happen you can uh, label the donor and acceptor either to the mRNA and one part of the ribosome, two part of the ribosome, we are talking about the prokaryotic um, ribosome, you can um, label the donor to the 50th subunit and the acceptor to the 30th subunit, that is a paper that explains uh, the ratcheting motion of these ribosomes, precise that ratcheting motions in um, stepwise uh, this, um, ratcheting motion of the ribosome in nanometer resolution by uh, labeling uh, the 50 subunit and 30 subunit uh, to different um, donor and acceptor in this way. So what are the things you can monitor here? You can monitor um, how molecules, suppose you have a donor here and acceptor here, and we have some linker which keeps holding, suppose you are monitoring the uh, protein folding, you are monitoring some kind of DNA looking or something. So if any conformational change is happening, and if you uh, label that system with a donor and acceptor, as soon as they come closer, closer to um, each other, you can see an increase in the uh, rate efficiency. Or for some reason, if the linker size is also decreasing, you can see an increase in rate efficiency. And if for some reason, if you are doing an experiment where the linker is breaking down, the donor and acceptor will uh, um, go away from each other and you will see a loss of rate efficiency completely. So when there is a loss of rate efficiency in single molecule methods, it's a bit difficult to say it's a loss of rate is because of the donor and acceptors are completely went away from uh, each other or it's because of photo bleaching because we are monitoring one molecule. Photo bleaching is uh, a very uh, interfering phenomenon I have already said and there are many other uh, disadvantages of single molecule uh, methods of which I talk during the towards the end of the lecture. You can monitor different protein protein interaction, protein DNA interaction like this. Uh, suppose we are monitoring protein protein interaction. If they are like um, uh, two uh, away from uh, each other or they are not interacting, you will not get any threat. But if they are interacting and the donor and acceptor are still keeping away from each other, there is a chance that you will not get any threat also. But if they are interacting and for some reason the uh, donor and the acceptor coming closer to each other, you get a, a very high threat. So from the threat efficiency again, you can calculate how far the, the, uh, the proteins are, how, uh, how much time uh, it takes for the proteins to interact with each other. You can um, find, you can monitor interaction phenomena, you can uh, um, monitor proteolysis phenomena, you can monitor conformational changes, you can uh, monitor transcription uh, initiation by monitoring, uh, by labeling uh, donor and acceptor at different positions, you can you, uh, monitor transcription terminations by uh, again um, uh, labeling donor and acceptor at different positions, you can uh, monitor the targeting, you can uh, monitor structural dynamics of um, during the translation phenomena in the ribosome, as I have explained, you can monitor the compaction of uh, uh, nucleogens during uh, acetylation, during acylation, how this uh, DNA is getting compacted um, inside the, uh, around the um, nucleogen, the, around the, uh, in, inside the cell, you can monitor those phenomena with very uh, high precision with uh, a nanometer resolution as well. The sliding of uh, during uh, DNA repairing or um, uh, any kind of processes, the sliding of the helicase, the helicase activity, how it is binding, how fast it is binding, whether it's binding or not, how it is working once it binds to the DNA, um, every details we can uh, find out uh, by uh, tagging the helicase and the DNA at different part of DNA. 
and you can do all this kind of complicated experiment but you have to uh, uh, attach either the dna or the protein to the surface by uh, the methods that i have explained in the previous slides you can monitor different dna repairing uh, phenomena different parts of dna repairing phenomena you can monitor enzyme activity and many more so this is uh, um, this comes the end of this lecture about uh, single molecule threat there are many applications there are many um, limitations as well which i'll uh, describe later the next class as i said uh, will be on optical closure on 24 uh, september at the same time now i expect any questions if there is any questions any doubt by the participants i'll be happy to take the questions Is there any questions by the participants, which I cannot see or hear? No, sir. Okay. Till now, we don't have any questions. Should we wait for some more time? There is one question. You can see it in the uh, chat box. Can you see the question? Uh, not yet. Uh, stop sir, uh, stop sharing at okay, the top sharing. of the screen. Sir, go uh, go. Uh, at the top of the screen, yes, you can yes. uh, share it. Uh, and in the chat chat mode, chat. Na, uh, you can see the. Uh, can we decide on the length of nucleotides between the thread pair? Uh, see, as I said, for a thread to happen, the donor and acceptor has to be there within the range of 10 to uh, uh, 100 angstrom. I mean, one to ten nanometer. So you have to specifically label if you want the thread to happen. You have to specifically label your donor and acceptor uh, within that range only. So, like if you talk about a, a single uh, DNA, the distance between two ends are mostly about um, two to three nanometer. So if you are uh, labeling at this side and this side, it is about two to three nanometer. But if you label at two different positions, you cannot beyond, you cannot label the donor and acceptor beyond a distance which crosses 10 nanometer because there, there will be no threat in that case. Besides fluorescence, can other spectroscopy be feasibly used for single molecule analysis? Of course, yes. So tomorrow, the next class that um, I'm going to discuss uh, is about optical fusion, which is a non fluorescence technique, which is a non fluorescence technique. We do not have to use fluorescence but you still can uh, uh, see or you still can manipulate um, biological phenomena uh, using just optical vision. How can we uh, choose a thread pair if we want to study DNA protein interactions? No, so choosing a thread pair is not very difficult. Choosing a thread pair as I said I have given a list of um, thread pairs that are commercially available. The Any thread pair are good I, I should tell you. Rather, you should look what are the lasers or what are the excitation sources you have. If you have, like, mostly excitation sources, sources are very uh, important. 
because we have to create that evanescent wave and evanescent intensity is very very less so if the evanescent wave is not able to excite your um, toner you cannot see any friend so and you cannot of course because lasers are so expensive you cannot have multiple lasers associated to it, your system probably there is some limitations so like the system i have i have only two lasers that there's a 532 nanometer laser there is a 637 nanometer laser so you have to select your uh, donor and acceptor pair depending upon what what excitation laser you have if you have a 532 nanometer laser you choose a fluorophore which is which can excite uh, dead by 532 nanometer so this is how you choose a fluorophore and there are uh, other conditions of the uh, donor and acceptor like it should be very stable you cannot choose any random uh, thing which do not uh, which are not very uh, pretty much stable but this is how we can do I think I have explained uh, this uh, question. Besides uh, fluorescence, can other spectroscopy be feasibly used for single molecule analysis? Yes, of course. Two methods which people usually use are one is uh, optical tweezer, which is very widely used by many people, which uh, do not need uh, chloropores to be attached. Another is uh, um, atomic force microscope, which do not need a chloropore to be attached. So there are. For Cytri and Sci-Fi pair, how much length of DNA should be sufficient for good threat efficiency? See, if you, uh, uh, if you know about the Cytri and Sci-Fi threat pair, uh, the cluster radius radius for Psi 3, Psi 5 thread pair is about 54 angstrom, which is 5.4 nanometer. So, uh, any distance around this cluster radius, like as I said, uh, if you remember what I described, cluster radius is, cluster radius is the uh, distance where the effic max efficiency is of about 50 percent. So, at 54 nanometer, the efficiency is 50 percent. So, if you go below that, the efficiency is a bit more. If you go beyond that, the efficiency is less. So, if you have to place the uh, donor and acceptor within um, 10 nanometer, but if they are very close, like as I said, if you are just monitoring a DNA and uh, if you uh, have donor and acceptor, the distance between the two ends of the DNA is about 2 to 3 nanometer. If you uh, have donor and acceptor labeled here and here, you get a very flat efficiency. But if you have a uh, donor as uh, label here and the acceptor label here and the distance between them is about 8 nanometer let's say the threat efficiency is less but we have to label the um, donor and acceptor within the range of 10 nanometer I think these are the questions. If there are still some questions which are uh, I am not, uh, uh, I could not explain you properly, or there is some doubt that is coming, you are always welcome to uh, interact with me. You can uh, write to me and ask your doubts or discuss with me. Does the interacting protein size affects the threat efficiency? The uh, interacting protein size usually do not affect the ep efficiency, but if the dye that you are using, if that is interacting with the protein, then it affects the threat efficiency. 
and that eventually affects the entire phenomenon. But the size of the protein usually do not usually do not affect the threat efficiency. Okay, sir. Uh, now we don't have any questions. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. So uh, I'm now closing the meeting. Yes, please. Okay, sir. Thank you. Welcome, sir.